America. A nation of many identities, ethnicities, cultures, and backgrounds. In the big cities, you can find all sorts of fascinating things. Fast food joints, bourgeois boutiques, neglected neighborhoods, towering ivory monuments, encampments, beaches, factories, casinos, rundown apartment complexes, and massively overpriced condominiums. The rich and the poor. Like so many things, it is a spectrum. Even the biggest cities have windows into the way the other half lives, regardless of what side of that electrified fence you currently occupy. But the cities of Grand Theft Auto were always the focus. We've already gotten HD versions of New York with Liberty City, Los Angeles with Los Santos, and soon, hopefully, Miami with Vice City and the release of GTA 6. Sure, we've gotten glimpses into how these places were portrayed in the old games and the 3D universe renditions of each of these cities, as well as San Fierro and Las Venturas. But starting with the release of GTA 4 in 2008, we've gotten much more detailed and fleshed out versions of them that are just bursting with social commentary about the nature of the country they seek to portray. Both intentional and not so. GTA is not alone in its portrayal of massive cities and seeking to highlight the people and places, both real and fictional, but it did, arguably, set the standard when it screamed onto the scene more than 20 years ago. And it has continued to be one of the most fascinating pieces of media that in my opinion, offers one of the most comprehensive snapshots of America's zeitgeist at the time of each game's release. There is, perhaps, no other piece of media than the most recently released GTA title, whatever it might be, to give you a glimpse into just how a lot of the country was thinking about various issues, large and small. It may not be comprehensive, not everyone plays video games after all, but a whole lot more do these days than don't. More than half of all people of all genders, colors, and socio-political backgrounds. Today, I want to look at just a small fraction of the American zeitgeist from 11 years ago when Grand Theft Auto V released in 2013. There have been some updates to that portrayal, with GTA Online's constantly updating map but the bulk of GTA 5's map and general feel remains trapped in the early 2010s. GTA 6 is looming over us and will be upon us sooner rather than later, I hope. So I thought what better time to really look closely at what the world Rockstar Games created a decade ago said about you, me, the world, and America by leaving the borders of Los Santos for the countryside and the areas of GTA 5's map you may have forgotten about or simply overlooked. Today I want to look at small town America as seen in Grand Theft Auto 5. Join me, won't you? I started my journey of cultural examination in the bougiest place outside of the rich neighborhoods in Los Santos, the coastal community of Chumash along the Western Highway. Chumash is described by Dave Norton as the land of beach hipsters and is overall a fairly wealthy town, much like its most prominent inspiration, the coastal town of Malibu, California. It consists of essentially just two sections in both the north and south, which are ever so slightly separated. The main road of the town being the aforementioned Western Highway, with both districts also having a single road connecting to it, with mostly residential lots and a couple of smaller commercial ones. The most prominent and standout feature of Chumash is perhaps its beach, lined with mansions, often on stilts, and plenty of those beach hipsters that Dave mentioned, though 
they rarely actually go surfing, likely because they never bothered to program animations for the activity. That, or the town consists of almost exclusively posers who like to buy surfboards and portray themselves as the surfs up type, but never actually find the courage to partake in the dangerous sport. You can find a number of cute little shops along the smaller roads and occasionally on the highway road itself. The kinds of shops that seem like they've been around a long time run by locals like Mom's Pie Diner, No Mark's Cleaner, or Hang 10 Surfboard Rental, as well as souvenir shops, liquor stores, and banks like the Fleesa one that you rob in the first GTA Online heist. In the north, you'll also find Chumash Plaza with several shops that allow the residents to actually stay in Chumash rather than needing to go to Los Santos every time they need to buy something. Some of these shops are enterable and for player use, like the Suburban Clothes Store or the Ammunition, but others are simply set decoration meant to flesh out the world like Ink Ink, Nelson's General Store, Davis Hardware, and even a second bank, the Chumash branch of the Blaine County Savings and Loan Bank. One of the coolest locations, or it would be if every interior was enterable and Chumash was a real place, is the Chumash Historic Family Pier with the Barracuda Cafe Bar and Restaurant out at the end. I couldn't find an exact direct real-world analog for this place, but I'm sure bars at the end of piers like this are all over California, I assume. Something that will come up with almost all of the towns we'll be looking at today is that the borders are ambiguous at best. I'm sure there are actual borders defined within the game's files, but A, that's boring, and B, I can't be arsed to find them, so it's hard to say whether an area like the Pacific Bluffs Country Club is actually technically in Chumash or just outside of it. This is where the richest of beachgoers spends their time, and while nice, it represents that most exclusionary of establishments, which will seem increasingly standoffish as we move outside of the immediate Los Santos metropolitan area and into the real sticks of Blaine County. Chumash is technically a town and not part of Los Santos proper, but while small, it doesn't exactly fit the vibe of small town America that I was referring to in the title. Our next location, though, certainly does. Much more so than Chumash, the small patchwork of trailer parks, desert plazas, single-story homes, and industrial businesses that make up the town of Harmony is even harder to define in terms of its borders. Again, I'm sure there is an actual answer to this question, but it's not one you can easily stumble upon, and the ambiguity of where exactly this community begins and ends is, I think, part of its charm. It is, according to the GTA Wiki anyway, primarily based on the community of Oasis in Riverside County, which is itself so tiny and obscure that when you look up pictures of it, all you get are pictures of the local greenery. Even the Google car didn't want to come out here for very long. Harmony is overlooked by the headquarters for the Rebel radio station, and its most recognizable landmark is probably the station's enormous tower broadcasting across the rural parts of the state and beyond. However, most people won't visit the radio tower, so perhaps the more recognizable location in town is actually the series of plazas, gas stations, and other small businesses along US Route 68. I think the fact that Rockstar somehow resisted the urge to call it Route 69 shows perhaps some mild growth on their part as writers since the days of the 3D era. Something that occurred to me while filming for this episode was that a lot of the more obscure businesses in GTA 5 are there just to make the world feel more alive and have normalish names. This is unlike the older games, where basically every single store was a chance to make a crass joke about one group or another in an attempt at social commentary. 
though the vast majority boiled down to, ha, gay people exist and like things that are different than me. Maybe I'm looking too much into it, and those kinds of businesses do still exist, but more often than not, there's a little more thought put into their naming, placement, and context within the world of GTA 5, now that they are a little bit more than just a store sign that you pass, maybe read, and then never think about again. Lots of them are still there to do just that, but now, every business has to have at least some thought put into the logistics of the building's construction, its potential customer base, how it functions within its community, etc, etc, and this means fewer opportunities for awful jokes, and more opportunities for unintentional or not social commentary on the state of small towns just like Harmony in rural California, New York State, Florida, or just about anywhere in the United States. Back to that prominent stretch of businesses on Route 68, we have places like Scoop's Liquor Bar, because every small town has to have one, maybe two, actually usually at least two liquor stores, and many, many, many gas stations and motels for the folks just passing through, since the actual permanent population of the town is probably in the low hundreds, if that. This place is basically Radiator Springs, a small forgotten town along a once famous freeway in the American countryside. I know this reference dates me, but once again, I couldn't care less. I am just a simple Canadian lady who has had very little money or opportunity to travel, so many of my own references for American culture, like probably a lot of yours, happen to come from other media like Grand Theft Auto. The town has businesses, but they don't often serve the same purpose as a lot of the smaller, more quaint locations in, say, Chumash. These stores are almost all in plazas and are there primarily for tourists, like the pet store, two for one, so when one dies the kids won't cry, but there are still smaller local bars and taverns that are probably frequented more by the town's actual residents and kept alive by luck and rural determination, or something like that. The town is surrounded by big industrial lots, like Stoner Cement Works, which sadly probably does not encourage its employees to work high as kites on the best California grass around. I, I mean, San Andreas grass. As well as a massive oil field and other small factories or similar such places. Most of the town's residents probably work here, but let's be honest, the profits from such businesses certainly aren't going back into the town itself or its infrastructure. Speaking of residents, most of them live in trailer parks dotted around the area, but a few of these slightly more wealthy ones manage to afford small, single-story homes a short drive from the commercial areas. These are few and far between, however, and again, it's hard to say whether they even are technically considered part of the town of Harmony or lie just outside its legal boundaries. This video and all videos on my channel are brought to you in large part by the wonderful support of my YouTube members and my patrons on Patreon.com. An extra special thank you to my executive producer and Walkerville tier supporters, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, King GTA 15, Die Castinator, and Michael Vandenberg. Supporters at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is also brought to you by Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99, Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel, and Diecastinator's channel all about diecast cars. I release all videos a little early to all supporters and give you any of the original music tracks created for a given video. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos produced while you are pledged, get access to a small patron slash members only Discord server where you can easily speak with me or see little behind the scenes snippets, and you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible. 
and I can't properly express how grateful I am to you all. Sign up as a YouTube member today, or get slightly better prices at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian. Thank you so much for watching. Harmony might be small and rural, but at least it has some infrastructure. The same cannot be said of our next location though, the Biker Village, formerly known as Sunset Shores, now appropriately called Stab City, by either the locals, or more likely, the people who live outside of it. Stab City isn't a city at all. As I said, it's barely a town, if that. We'll never know just how big the community of Sunset Shores was before it got taken over by bikers, but taken over by bikers it was at some unspecified point. I assume post-2008, when the Lost MC either migrated or expanded out to the west coast. This place is mostly just a place for bikers, and those immediately tied to those bikers, to hide from the law and general society. It consists of old discarded vehicles, trailers, and makeshift outdoor community centers, although there was a couple of houses that started to get built, presumably before the bikers arrived, but none of them were ever actually completed for whatever reason. Stab City is quite aptly based on the real world alternative lifestyle community, as Google describes it, Slab City, in Imperial County, California. However, the real world location appears to be primarily a Christian village, also featuring the Salvation Monument, which has a parallel in the game as well, but well beyond the biker village and closer to the town of Grapeseed, which we'll get to later in the video. But at least Stab City has a few trailers and buildings, as well as things like the outdoor stage for events, probably mostly drunken biker sing-alongs. Is that a thing? It should be. Not to mention plenty of vehicles owned by the residents, legitimate or not, since, you know, they're bikers. Bikers were bikers were bikers, and occasionally fly helicopters and kidnap all men, and mostly were bikers. The same, however, cannot be said of our next location, where we get to see GTA 5's portrayal of homeless encampments beyond the ones under the Los Santos Freeway. I take you now to Dignity Village. This is a location that you may have never even heard of, perhaps if you're the type to explore every nook and or cranny of the game map, you've been here, but if you mostly just play the main game missions, you may have missed it entirely. In the northeast corner of the game map, right across from the Procopio truck stop, where the mission Pac-Man ends, is a set of elevated train tracks which run parallel to the main highway. At one of the storm drain entrances which runs underneath these tracks is a path leading to a small encampment area marked by homemade signs and consisting almost entirely of tents with only two notable buildings, one of which does not appear to have any actual electricity. Dignity Village is based on a place of the same name in Portland, Oregon, and just like the real world location, it is primarily a place for the downtrodden and unhoused, or as they put, the poor, the unemployed, in debt and fed up, to live in some very relative security. It's actually much smaller and even less urbanized, for lack of a better word, than the real Dignity Village. The only notable structures here are the one house, which may have been the basis for the village's creation, which also has a trailer next to it, and appears to have running water and electricity, as well as the community center, if you can call it that, which denotes the location as a commune which accepts all. I'm from Southern Ontario, and for most of my life, in my medium-sized city, unhoused people were a rare sight, and something that, like most parts of North America, was casually ignored and forgotten about by everyone else. However, in the last 10 years or so, my city and lots of places across North America have experienced a surge in people unable to make ends meet in this capitalist dystopia we call modern society. I see homeless people every day now, and it has become such a problem that my city council recently voted to move all of the infrastructure ostensibly put in place to help them as far away from the general public as they could get away with. 
On the surface, they call it revitalization, but they all know exactly what it is, both the council and the people that they're doing it to. Out of sight, out of mind. We're getting real here, folks, but it was Dignity Village here which inspired this video that was originally just going to be a follow-up to last week's video looking at the towns and cities of the 3D universe, but now in the HD. I think of myself as having struggled financially my entire adult life so far, and in a certain context I have. But while I have teetered on the edge of being forced to live in a place like this, I never have, and especially these days, as a trans woman, the thought of ever having to is terrifying. Perhaps some of you will find irony or hypocrisy in me saying this, while also having a Patreon ad in the same video, and maybe you have a point, so I want to make this clear. These are the people who are really struggling. As much as I would love for you to join my Patreon and support the work I do here, if you can instead find a way to help or support your own community's local unhoused population, it is a much better cause. They need food and shelter much more than I need makeup and guitars. The fact that so many people can see things like this and yet still convince themselves that it's just because those people are inherently lazy or lesser and just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps is a depressing reality and a convenient little narrative that the kind of people who own second homes in Chumash, or Malibu actually, have convinced you of so that we fight each other instead of help one another. I'm not better than most. I don't go around donating my money to the unhoused for plenty of the same reasons you probably don't, but while filming the b-roll for this video, I also stumbled onto an article about the growing problem in my community and how the rich, well-off, and yes, very privileged owner class plans to push the problem away from the public eyes and continue pretending it doesn't exist. And all of this caused me to do some self-reflection. This is just some dumb video about Grand Theft Auto on YouTube. If you're watching it, you have the benefit of having a phone plan or an internet connection and probably a safe enough place to watch it. So maybe the next time you see someone down on their luck, who would probably appear right on brand as it were here in Dignity Village, give them a little bit of food or a few dollars or just the time of day for some simple one-on-one -on -one human connection. Social justice for all. We're not quite done though. We still have plenty more small town America to visit and examine. And next on our list is probably the most famous of the in-game small towns, Sandy Shores. Sandy Shores is of course where the game's third protagonist initially lives during the game's story, Trevor Phillips. It is a slight upgrade, I suppose, from a place like Harmony, but not much and it depends entirely on one's personal circumstances. But it is a definite improvement in terms of lifestyle over somewhere like Stab City or Dignity Village, as sad as that state of affairs is. Sandy Shores, after all, has its own sheriff's office, medical center, a gas station, an old, albeit abandoned motel, and at least according to the in-game sign, 3,010 permanent residents as of the last census. That means just over 3,000 people who, while obviously not doing the best financially, are still living on the grid and have access to food, water, and shelter, which is more than can be said for our last two locations. That being said though, Sandy Shores is still rough to say the least. Many of its buildings and businesses are abandoned, and while the town might have once been prosperous, for a rural community, that time has long since passed and most folk here now are just barely making it by on the fringes of society. Though if people like Trevor and Ron are anything to go by, they couldn't be happier with their lot in life. Except Trevor is actually rich, even when we first meet him, so that's not actually fair at all. Yeah, I mean, when you gain control of Trevor for the first time in Sandy Shores, he has a hundred thousand dollars on him, and let me tell you, that's more money than I've ever seen at one time in my entire life, and I'm from the city. Trevor is, as Michael points out, a hipster, 
and he almost seems to enjoy the portrayal of being down on his luck and rural more than anything else. If he wanted to, with the money he makes making and selling illicit substances, he could live a relatively normal upper middle class life in the city or even on the outskirts of a place like Sandy Shores. Instead, he chooses to live in a trailer that he keeps in disgusting condition for the sake of performing being poor to perhaps gain sympathy from the city folk that he hates. Even Ron has a home and bills and a job as both Trevor's lackey and a radio host on Rebel Radio. More than can be said for people like Cletus, or perhaps the town's most fascinating piece of social commentary, Clinton. No, not Franklin Clinton. I'm talking about this guy. I'm in hell! The town is made up of a handful of small residential blocks of pretty much exclusively trailers, many of which have tall American flags proudly protruding from their rooftops to celebrate their pride in a country which has in so many ways abandoned and forgotten them. But it has enough people with enough money to support small businesses like, of course, several liquor stores, small grocers, tattoo parlors, and hair salons, and even its own gun store. Hell, some people here have trailers with more than one story or custom-built decks and yards. Still a ways off from what you might find in the nicer parts of the city, but much nicer than almost anything you'd find in Stab City or definitely Dignity Village. It's once again hard to define exactly what the borders of Sandy Shores are, though. There's the core of the town, which is pretty unambiguous, but then there are parts that are extended well beyond it, like additional liquor stores, convenience stores, and abandoned buildings that are literally used to manufacture illicit substances that are then sold by the comparatively bourgeois player base of GTA Online. Especially anyone who has ever purchased a shark card. Sandy Shores has roads though, albeit dirt ones, and police which patrol them, and presumably some kind of a mayor or town council, though maybe not with Trevor living there. But as small and low class as it is compared to the city, it's still a major step up from the places which don't even have consistent access to running water. I mean, just about anywhere with a convenience store is at least doing well enough for people to even consider having conveniences at all. There's plenty of reason to believe that Sandy Shores was at one point an actual decent place to live, though it's long since been gradually abandoned due to economic opportunities most likely. There are many shops which now sit empty, like the old motel, and even areas for community recreation, like, well, the Sandy Shores Beachfront Recreation Area, which at one point was probably brimming with life and activity. Now though, it's home to a lot of dead fish, and abandoned boats. Sandy Shores is mostly based on the towns which surround the real world Salton Sea, which is what the Alamo Sea is based on. Primarily Bombay Beach and Desert Shores, of course, but also places like Victorville and Joshua Tree. Around the relative corner from Sandy Shores, though, is a town which is, on paper, a little bigger, but in practical terms is actually quite a bit smaller, at least in terms of population, Grapeseed. Unlike Sandy Shores, which is primarily residential, Grapeseed is almost exclusively made up of farmland and seems to serve as one of the main sources of food production of the state of San Andreas and having very few, if any, real residential zones. But it depends once again on exactly where you define the borders of Grapeseed, since the area just east of Sandy Shores has a few shops and presumably apartments above them on the road which leads into the town proper. This is also where we find the game's version of Salvation Mountain, Beam Me Up, which unlike the real-world religious monument, is instead a monument to the obsession with the extraterrestrial that is often attributed to parts of rural California, Nevada, Utah, and beyond, but is quite a drive from its real-world location near Slab City. Grapeseed is really just a ton of farms and not a whole lot else. There is a single road in the northwest, which also has the town's only commercial businesses, if this little area isn't counted, but all that's here is a farmer's market, a clothes store, a hardware store, and the occasional single-story house. 
The rest is farms, 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 and more farms, as well as the town's tiny little airstrip, which the player ends up using, and can thus be discounted as apparently relevant at all to the town's economic prospects, given what the player is actually using it for, which is to say, smuggling. The money from which definitely, once again, does not go back into the town, unless Trevor buys a new outfit at the store, I guess. Grapeseed is apparently based primarily, but not exclusively, on Bakersfield, California, but it is drastically less urbanized, with barely any commercial businesses beyond what you find on that one street. There are no theaters or churches or other such expected amenities that you'd find in a place like Bakersfield, and it comes off mostly as a forgotten farming town, which probably gets very little in ways of visitation or tourism, seeing as there's nothing to see or do here. It's also, as we see from the game, a place heavily steeped in the manufacture and distribution of illicit substances, either by Trevor himself, or, before 2013 anyway, the O'Neill family, though they presumably also manufacture some food, like most of the town, either as just cover or as supplementary income to their existing illegal businesses. And finally, for today anyway, we arrive at the biggest of small town America, though not the richest as that was most definitely Chumash. To close off the video, we'll look at none other than the biggest settlement beyond Los Santos, Polito Bay. Polito Bay has elements from almost all the other smaller locations we've looked at today, which is why I saved it for the end. It has beachside residential lots, some of which are quite expensive looking a la Chumash, it has industrial lots and commercial plazas a la Harmony, actual civic services like Sandy Shores, including the only firehouse outside of the city that I could find, and even some farmland on the town's eastern edge like Grapeseed. Polito Bay is the only location of the ones we've looked at so far that if it were real, I actually wouldn't mind living in, having just enough to save the average person from needing to constantly visit the city. It is almost certainly primarily inspired by Morrow Bay, California, in San Luis Obispo County. I mean, just look at this photo and tell me otherwise. It probably owes its size to being a company town. Or rather, since that term has a lot of other cultural baggage surrounding it, being a town built around a specific company, keeping a bulk of the residents employed. In this case, that company being Cluck and Bell, or Clucking Bell Farms, or just bell farms, it's a bit confusing. As it stands, it appears as though the large factory complex on the town's southern edge, which the train tracks run right through for convenient offloading, is entirely owned by Clucking Bell's parent company. This is clearly where a lot of their products are manufactured before being shipped off to all corners of the state, and it might even be the company's primary manufacturing hub for the whole country given its massive size, taking up a good sixth of the entire town's footprint, depending once again on where one draws the boundaries. Speaking of which, there is the town proper, but also a large forest just beyond the main section, and a small touristy lodge, the Bayview Lodge, as well as the tram station which runs rides to and from the very top of Mount Chiliad, which the town sits in the shadow of. Polito Bay has actual roads though, unlike, say, Sandy Shores, consisting of three primary stretches with plenty of businesses, homes, and warehouses or factories, but many of them are directly tied in one way or another to Clucking Bell Farms. It appears to be prospering too, and might be a glimpse at how Sandy Shores once looked, with comparatively few abandoned businesses and plenty of construction constantly underway, demonstrating its desire to continue expanding. Though, if the lot which had been abandoned for at least five years at the time of release is anything to go off of, it isn't always successful. It has the biggest bank in Blaine County, which is robbed by the player in the Polito score, but none of the wreckage caused by the players is ever cleaned up for reasons, like the destroyed motel and crashed helicopter, which still sits there just as it did 11 years prior when visited in modern GTA Online. I guess nobody could be bothered to clean it up, and that, that doesn't surprise me. There's a full-on grocery store and pharmacy, discount and hardware stores, 
electronic stores, restaurants, a church, a gun store, and yes, plenty of snowbird hipsters. It's hard to say where the actual titular bay is, though, given the developers opted to keep the area surrounding San Andreas State as an infinite ocean, but I think it is implied that somewhere beyond the northern borders of the map would be more land, which would make the actual Polito Bay quite massive. Well, that about does it for today. This video was something a little bit different. A bit like my old series GTA Geographies, but with some social commentary sprinkled in here and there. I had fun making it, and a lot of fun just filming it and looking at areas of the GTA 5 map which you normally don't spend a lot of time in. If you've never done it, and you're a big GTA 5 fan, maybe go play the game and instead of focusing on all the chaos and main story missions, just enjoy the incredible attention to detail put into so much of the game's massive map. And if you're feeling really bold, and you can afford to do so, maybe even go out into the real world and do some actual exploring. Touch grass and all that. Stop and smell the roses sort of a thing, you know? That's kind of what this video was. Stopping and smelling the virtual roses, as it were, and looking at what the Grand Theft Auto games can say beyond what is explicit and in your face. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider subscribing, hitting the bell icon, and all that wonderful jazz. I'll see you next week, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening.